It's six o'clock, and I will call the first committee of the whole meeting to order. And I would like to thank all our guests for being here tonight. And the purpose of this meeting is to discuss information given by our fire department. Alderperson Montemayor is sitting in today taking notes for Alderman Hannah is missing tonight. Would you like to call the roll? Oh, yes, of course. Alderman Bourne? Here. Alderman Bauck? Here. Alderman Serda? Here. Alderman Gisha? Here. Alderman Hannah? Excused. Alderman Heidemann? Here. Alderman Kittleson? Here. Alderman Clyunas? Alderman Manny? Excused. Alderman Meyer? Here. Alderman Montemayor? Here. Alderman Renfleisch? Excused. Alderman Ryan? Here. Alderman Vanderweel? Here. Alderman Verhasselt? Here. Alderman Wangeman? Here. There's a quorum. The quorum is present. Moving on to item number three on our agenda, it is public input, and we ask that you limit your comments to five minutes per person, and we will go in order of the sign-up sheet. Uh, Dr. Susan Martins? Not yet. How about Lori Selman? Thank you. Um, Jerry Isbell signed you up here, which is fine. I just need your address. Okay. Um, 2763. 2763. County Road I. County Road I. Sockville. Sockville. All right. Okay. You'll have five minutes. Good evening. My name is Laura Selman. Turn it on. S is in Sam. Turn it on. E F. Laura. L A U R A. Selman. S is in Sam. E L L M A N N. I'm here addressing you as the president of Orange Cross Ambulance. Um, as you know, we do provide a quality, a high-quality, pre-acute service to the, city of, to the city of Sheboygan citizens as well as part of the county. We've done this since 1979, and we're quite proud of what we do. I know you'll be hearing a presentation from the city's fire department later this evening on transferring the 911 calls from, uh, for the city to their pro proposed paramedic units. In considering this proposal, I ask you to ponder the, th the following thoughts. Orange Cross Ambulance has provided this service to the city at no cost to taxpayers. What will you do if the projections that you see tonight are not accurate? Many of our paramedics and their families are residents of the city. What will you say to them as you eliminate their jobs? We have approximately 40 employees. In the post 9-11 world, and even in the view of the recent landmark uh, fire, have you considered the impact of eliminating 40 EMS professionals from our emergency medical system? These EMS professionals do not cost taxpayers a penny, but they are available. And during the time of the landmark fire, we experienced eight ambulance calls um, from Sheboygan residents. Can you be absolutely sure that the high quality level of paramedic services provided to your citizens will be duplicated, or in a year or two will the fire department face uh, what the police department is facing today? As older persons, you must give consideration to these thoughts and others before you rush into changing a system that is working extremely well, one that is vital to the safety of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Dolce Johnson. <coughs> I have your address. Chairman Meyer and Committee of the Whole. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you because when issues are handled the way the ambulance issue has been handled, I see lots of red flags. Frantic actions in an attempt to pass documents with the greatest possible speed. A document of major significance introduced not by the chairman of the appropriate committee, but by an alderman in office for only two weeks with the intent of suspending the rules and no opportunity for public input. Is it a slam dunk? Has the vote already been taken? You also have a document authorizing the transfer of funds from the 2007 budget for the purchase of three ambulances and supplies 
and for salaries and benefits, while the document to transfer ambulance service to the fire department hasn't even been voted on officially. I understand that the plan is to take $500,000 from the $8 million public works slush fund to purchase the ambulance and transfer $300,000 from the general fund to train four paramedics and purchase ambulance supplies. I thought the 2007 budget was a bare bones budget, a 0% tax increase budget. My taxes went up several hundred dollars in the 2007 bare bones 0% tax increase budget. So of course I'm upset to learn that there's evidently an extra $300,000 hidden in this bare bones budget, which raises the question, how much more is hidden? Your constituents deserve better. Your constituents deserve and expect open and honest government. Why is the fire department so anxious to assume the ambulance service? I've heard that when firemen have assisted at an emergency, they've asked persons to write a letter to the newspaper or call their aldermen about their service. When there was concern in 2005 that the new fire station on the far south side would not be built, I remember then Chief Zier saying that the city wouldn't have to hire any more new firemen because he had three on the payroll that he could just transfer right over there. I talked with Don Van Akron at that time as he was chairman of salaries and grievance, and suggested that the TO needed to be changed to delete three unnecessary firemen. Of course, nothing happened. When the ambulance issue was discussed in 2005, Chief Zier said he would only have to hire five more people to run the ambulance service. Now we're told there's only need to for three or four. Does anybody really know? It is apparent that we have too many firemen with not enough to do. <clears throat> But somehow it doesn't make sense to me to hire three or four or five more people with not enough to do and pay them high wages and exceptional benefits. Obviously, firemen are not fighting fires 24-7, and ambulance personnel are not answering emergency calls 24-7. The result is that you are hiring more people with not enough to do. One of the aldermen I spoke with even talked about providing service for the rest of the county. You can't be serious. Is this another primrose path, another too-good-to-be-true money-making idea? Remember the marina? We were told that someone would pay the city a million dollars to operate the marina. The result is that the city is paying Skipper Bud to run it, and the taxpayers are subsidizing it. Remember Blue Harbor? Blue Harbor is losing money big time. And then there's the recent municipal court, which I'm told is costing the city money because people aren't paying their fines. Well, previously, the city received half a million dollars from the county with no expense to city taxpayers. Now we pay for a judge and support staff. Violators are not paying their fine, and I presume that this means contracting with a collection agency to collect them. What about the bad debts for an ambulance service that will surely add up because people won't or don't pay their bills, as was the experience with the police department when they ran the ambulance service? Will it require another taxpayer subsidy for a service that is now tax-free? Perhaps we can put the firemen to work helping with police duties, reading meters, keeping neighborhoods safe, etc. There are communities that use police and firemen in dual roles. I'm told that the fire chief is willing to make concessions, but what happens after five years? Will they then expect to recoup all of their concessions? Why fix something that isn't broken? Orange Cross is doing a good job. Their response times are well within their contract, and the service doesn't cost the taxpayers a dime. Government should not be in the business of providing services that private enterprise can provide. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Martins? Could you give me your address when you get here? 38 Lake Breeze Lane. Lake, Lake Breeze Lane. Random Lake. Thank you. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to address the council. I'm Dr. Suzanne Martins. I'm the EMS Medical Director for St. Nicholas Emergency Department, Orange Cross Ambulance, and the majority of the EMS agencies in the county. 
<clears throat> my background is in emergency medicine. I also have had the unique opportunity to do um, EMS graduate work, and I've also just completed um, my master's in public health administration. The topic I would like to address is the importance of heart attack care in this county. Over the past six months, there has been a unique joint and cooperative effort made between both medical facilities, St. Nicholas uh, Hospital and Aurora Sheboygan Memorial Medical Center, as well as the EMS agencies in this county to form a joint effort in treating um, heart attacks in this county. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Sheboygan County EMS uh, providers encounter about 500 patients annually having chest pain. About one third of those, or 130 patients, are within the city itself. Of those patients, approximately 5% will be actually having a full heart attack, something that is a true medical emergency. You often see uh, ambulances driving lights and sirens. Typically, that's not actually indicated. This is one of the few indications for actual emergency care. The way that we diagnose heart attack is we have special equipment that does an electrocardiogram or an EKG. Now, many of you may have had an EKG done. Most of the time, it shows a normal reading or something that's non-diagnostic. As I said, occasionally we find people who are actually having a true heart attack. The indications for treatment for a true heart attack is rapid transport and immediate treatment. The rapid transport includes uh, transfer to a facility that can do interventional cardiology. We do not do that on an emergency basis in this county. Time is of the essence in heart attack patients. The American Heart Association has established a time goal. We try to get the patients into um, a situation where they can be treated within 90 minutes of diagnosis of a heart attack. For anyone who's had emergency care, you know that that is not an easy goal. Every delay of 30 minutes can result in up to a 42% chance of dying every 30 minutes. And even if you survive the first part of the heart attack over the next year, every 30 minute delay can result in up to an 8% chance of dying over the next year due to the incurred damage. It is estimated that by direct transfer to a cardiac facility, which in our case would either be to St. Mary's Ozaki or to St. Agnes in Fond du Lac, would um, save about an hour of death time in your heart. As I said, this is a unique cooperative effort. It's one of the first joint efforts that's been made by both medical facilities and throughout the EMS community. We have invested probably over $50,000 in equipment and unknown hundreds of manpower hours in training. Part of this effort is also a QA process all of our chest pain patients over the past seven years have been aggressively treated and every single case has been reviewed. The QA process in EMS is something that is not very well defined. It is one of the few things that I emphasize in our program and it is very closely scrutinized by the EMS providers in this county. Thank you. Thank you. We will be moving on to number four on our agenda and that is a presentation regarding City Fire Department, providing ambulance service to the citizens of Sheboygan.
<laughs> Not at all. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Fire Chief Jay Lestusky, and I would like to uh, thank uh, Mayor Perez, Chairperson Meyer, and members of the council and the citizens for this opportunity to present information tonight. I would like to just introduce our staff members here who have worked very diligently on this project and who will be trying to answer questions and going through some of the information. Uh, on my left is Commander Jeff Herman. On my right, Commander Chuck Butler, and seated back with the audience is Deputy Chief Steve Scheffner and Deputy Chief Steve Sharp. As chief of our department, along with uh, my staff, we feel that it's really our responsibility and obligation to bring forth a viable alternative to our current EMS system. Um, this is something that uh, we look very closely at in this time of, of revenue sharing cuts and, and, and taxpayer concerns and uh, with the hope of trying to maintain level of services and yet do that in a manner that is cost effective to the citizens, um, we have put together this pr proposal. We're very confident as we are with um, every other type of operation that we've overtaken throughout the years, whether it goes back to fire prevention, first responder, uh, public education, fire response, technical rescue, we've always approached all these different avenues and areas of our, our profession in a very professional way and a very dedicated way and we look uh, at this proposal in the same manner. I think there's a, a real concern and, and I understand the concern that this has been a fast-tracked, uh, kind of fast-moving not very well thought out proposal. And I think it's very important for us to lay the groundwork of how we got to our current point in time here. And uh, I'm gonna try to do it with uh, as uh, short as possible, but uh, the history goes all the way back to 1988 uh, when the fire department put forth a 32 page proposal to take over and assume the ambulance responsibilities back in, in 1988. At that time, uh, for whatever different reasons, um, the decision was made to go um, to a private entity and uh, there was um, a number of five-year contracts between that time and our, our present time where this, uh, pr this ambulance um, provision of service was, was reintroduced and looked at and, and decisions were made to extend contracts. In 2002, uh, we provided a ambulance contract proposal for the fire department to run the 911 service for the city of Sheboygan. And at that time, um, after an extremely heated process um, that uh, bordered, not bordered, it was ugly, uh, Commander Herman and myself were uh, a part of that process. Um, there was a lot of pain inflicted on both sides of the fence. Uh, Orange Cross Ambulance personnel, Sheboygan Fire Department personnel, and um, public uneasiness in the way that the, uh, the process was approached. And we were very committed to not have that occur again uh, when we re-looked at this, this topic in 2007 here. Um, in the aftermath of that 2005 proposal, uh, Chief, then Chief Zire and I um, attended a meeting to uh, dedicate the new ER room at uh, St. Nicholas Hospital. At, and this was, uh, I don't have the exact date on it, but it was post um, the 2002 proposal and the decision for the new Orange Cross uh, contract. And our discussions at that time with some of the hospital administrators um, 
was such that they, they said they were not opposed to the fire department providing the ambulance service. They thought we could do a good job. They were impressed with, um, with our level of service and abilities, but there was a very much of a concern for the provision of service for inter-facility transports and, um, and county 911 calls, which was not included in our proposal. So as we pondered that over the next few years, um, when I became chief in, in January 1st of 2006, I had a meeting with uh, Mr. Bonk from Aurora, who um, discussed the fact that in most Aurora served areas, fire department based EMS was providing service to those areas. And with the information from that meeting that I had with Mr. Bonk, uh, we moved forward as a staff and tried to look at a way that we could approach this um, that would eliminate or at least certainly mitigate um, the ugliness and, and uh, painful process that we went through the last time when, uh, when this ambulance uh, situation came forward. With that information in hand, we made many meeting, uh, we, de we decided to look at the model that Manitowoc Fire Department had used to consolidate um, the private ambulance service into the fire department in Manitowoc. This was done in, a, in about 2003. Um, by all apparent accounts, it was very successful, both financially and as far as a level of service provided. We made numerous trips up to Manitowoc and met with uh, their staff, the financial director of Manitowoc and the mayor of Manitowoc to ensure that we were on the right track in approaching um, this from the perspective that we were looking at. And we took into consideration the concerns regarding city and county 911 and inter-facility transport, and we intended to identify a process that we could move forward and uh, try to work through that. In fall of 2006, a presentation was given by Commander Butler and myself at Dr. Coolis's office to uh, Mr. Ed Bradley, Michelle Ustike, and Laura Selman of the Orange Cross Board of Directors. At that time, uh, we provided uh, an array of information regarding our level of training from, for our current people, uh, a kind of general proposal on what we were looking to do and, and move forward the process of uh, a consolidated service, much like um, was uh, being accomplished up in Manitowoc. Uh, there was some discussion on that, and a joint decision was made at that meeting to continue on with the process of looking at that option. And one of the important things that came out of that meeting is that we had a great concern for the viability of the current ambulance system if this information that we were working on that project and moving forth that project would come, become public, that there was a concern that um, Orange Cross ambulance's viability in the next year may be compromised due to, to current employees seeking other employment. And um, there was a concern on both parties that we keep this confidential and close to the vest until we had an opportunity to work through all the issues related to the consolidated ambulance service. On December 19th of 2006, Commander Butler, Mayor Perez, and I attended a a meeting with the full Orange Cross Board of Directors and hospital administrators for both hospitals. A full presentation was given to them at that time, uh, very similar to the previous one with more detail. And uh, there was a consensus of the meeting to allow the Sheboygan Fire Department and the Orange Cross Board of Directors to investigate the process for, for future consideration. On that same day, on December 19, 2006, that same presentation was given to Sheboygan County Board Chairman Bill Gehring. On January 18th of 2007, I'm just going through this timeline so you have an understanding of how we, how we got to where we are today. On January 18th, 2007, a meeting was held where uh, several members of the Orange Cross Board of Directors submitted specific written questions related to the consolidation process. And a general discussion was held regarding the possible acquisition of Orange Cross ambulance equipment and the incorporation of some of the Orange Cross personnel into our, our department. One of the last lines written in that um, written communications 
was as follows. Both the St. Nicholas Hospital and Aurora Memorial Medical Center Board of Directors are agreeable to evaluate the possible acquisition of Orange Cross Ambulance by the Sheboygan Fire Department. On January 31st of 2007, a written statement of a reply was sent to the Orange Cross Board of Directors and answering um, the questions that they had brought forth um, in the previous communication. On March 6, 2007, a follow-up meeting was held in Mayor Perez's office that included Mayor Perez, I believe it was Ed Bradley, Michelle Ustike, and I. Conversations on that, they included, again, the possible acquisition of vehicles and how that process would work, and discussion from the Orange Cross Board of Directors perspective regarding the possibility of the requirement to provide severance packages for some of their employees. It's our understanding that following that meeting, Several members of the Orange Cross Board of Directors traveled to Manitowoc to discuss the consolidation process um, that occurred in Manitowoc. And feedback from that meeting, um, at least to the best of my, my knowledge, was that the discussions were positive in nature. Over the following weeks after that, um, we attempted to make a few additional contacts and they were not responded to. And this process that we were working through apparently was terminated on April 24, 2007, when Ed Bradley and there may have been someone else with him, um, members of the Board of Directors, notified Mayor Perez that they were no longer willing to move forward with this process and had decided to seek a 10-year contract. Based on that situation and based on the fact that um, the timeline for the process of um, a new contract and or the Sheboygan Fire Department providing ambulance service January 1st, 2008, our staff made a little uh, direction change as far as what alternatives we could provide to the council that was within the council control. And that is the proposal that's, that's put in, for, in front of you tonight and that you've received last week. And this proposal addresses the portion of the ambulance transport service that is within the control of the council. As this process has been a lengthy one and with the thought in mind that there's a lot of work to be done, uh, including vehicle and equipment acquisition, state licensure, protocol development, hiring process, training issues, we ask that whatever decision is made is done in an expedient manner. If we're um, looking to begin this service beginning January 1 of 2008, this is a process that we need to move forward quickly. As you can tell, there's been a lot of thought, um, a lot of background put into this process. Our department has prepared itself over the years, even though we were not um, awarded the ability to provide ambulance service to the community. We continue to pre prepare ourselves with uh, trained personnel um, to a higher level than we needed to be trained at the time in order to position ourselves so we would have the availability to do this service at some point in time and we feel that time is now. I guess I would like to turn the mic over to Commander Herman who would walk you through the, the financial proposal that's in front of you. I think before I get into the uh, five or so pages of the exact figures of our proposal, which I think everybody wants to scrutinize. I'm going to try to put it in the uh, very simplest of forms as to why this will work financially for the city. If the city and a private enterprise were going to begin ambulance service on January 1st, 2008, and we each had to provide buildings, we each had to purchase equipment, and we each had to hire employees, there's no doubt that the private company could do it cheaper than the public, than the fire department. The difference between that scenario and what we are proposing is, what this, what's the same is we have the buildings in place. We don't need to go out and get buildings. The equipment that each service needs to have to provide this service is the same. The equipment is the same, the cost is the same. The difference is we are proposing to take on this service with only four additional employees. That's the difference between the two proposals. That's why it makes financial sense for the city. And I can begin by going through 
the numbers and I think I'll go through page by page and Commander Butler will put them up on the screen. And I think if you have questions as we go through, it probably is best that you ask them right away so that we're not jumping back and forth. If you look at page one, which is the full pay firefighter wage projection. We have a signed labor agreement that takes us through the end of 2009. So we're able to accurately give you the numbers for 2008 and 2009. Beyond 2009, 2010, 11, and 12, we've projected those numbers and the increases are listed in the columns. So if you look at 2008, the starting firefighter wage would be $35,682. Now as that firefighter keeps his employment in year number two, it increases to the 43,000 and so on down the line to the right. Now as we're in the first column again, going down the line number two, Wisconsin Retirement Fund, that is the pension that needs to be paid for that employee. And it increases as his tenure in the service increases. The third line is health insurance, and we used a blended rate because from our past experience, and again, we're talking about adding full, four firefighter paramedics. Our past experience is we've been getting in two single firefighters and two married firefighters, so we blended two family rates and two single rates to come up with that number. The fourth line represents the employee's share, and again, that's contractual as to how much they have to pay, and we did project it out again into the year 2012. The next line is the subtotal of the health insurance. The first year, we do not pay any uniform allowance because we don't pay it until a person passes his probation. That's why on the second year, in 2009, you'll see a higher amount that's actually two years of clothing uniform allowance. The next line is workers' compensation insurance, and we receive that number from the city's insurance carrier, which is CIVMIC. I believe it's 0.145% uh, of the firefighter's wage. Next line down is Medicare. That's a federal amount that's taken off. And the the next line down is the total of the firefighters' wages and fringe benefit package. And as you move to the right, that's, it goes down as his tenure increases. Next line down is times four for the four new hires. And then the following line is our overtime that we've projected. And the reason that that number, we did not increase it as the years go on is that we felt that the first year of our service, there may be times when our staffing, may, we may have the right amount of people there, but we may not have enough paramedics there that we're gonna have to call back paramedics on overtime. And we're also gonna be very cautious on that first year to make sure that as we're running a new service that we have enough coverage. So we feel that as we move into the service, um, our costs go up, but our amount of overtime usage should go down. And then the bottom line is the total um, amount for the wages and benefits with the overtime included. The next page is the exact same figures. Yep. Alderman Bourne. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, what's the current blend of the fire department as far as family versus single coverage? I, without looking it up, I couldn't give you the exact. It is higher than the 50%. Okay. Uh, also, then, when you, when you use the, uh, the term firefighter for wages at 35682, I'm assuming that's firefighter slash paramedic, that that's a... Correct. Somebody coming on board that's qualified for both. Correct. Thank you. The second page is exactly the same thing as the first page. Excuse me, Commander. We have one more. Okay. Um, I've got a question as far as the wages are concerned. Uh, most of the departments that already handle this uh, ambulance service, are those employees that are paramedics, are they paid at a different rate than a normal firefighter? Uh, typically, throughout the state, you'll see an average of between probably 4 and 6% as a premium pay for paramedic. 
that is not figured into this proposal um, simply because that's a negotiated item. If we put a set dollar in here, that would really tie our hands as far as negotiating. We do have um, an assurance from the local firefighters union that they will work with us to implement it and some, site, some type of a step-in, phased-in program. Okay, so then after, uh, since we're only looking at a three-year contract here, so then there's a possibility that uh, we go into negotiations after the three years are up, and the union says, well, we want to have more money for those paramedics. And uh, we come to a, a situation where uh, we can't meet the resolve, you can't, department heads, and we can't work it out to keep it at the same rate. It goes to arbitration. Where do you think that's going to come down? If you want to look at, we did figure it out in the worst case scenario or the average, which would be probably a 5% premium pay, at a full paid firefighter would be roughly $35,000 for a year. Uh, for everybody. For everybody. For everybody. Yes. Okay. okay. Alderman Bulk, did you have a question? Uh, I do, thank you. Uh, this goes up, the, the pay goes up 70% over a four period set of years. Is that, is that typical for a, a new firefighter hire? Our, uh, That's a remarkable increase. I'd like to sign up for that plan. Our starting pay is relatively low compared to the statewide average. I can assure you that the next five years after this does not go up at that rate. This, their next rate pay raise after this is at 10 years. Okay. And that's consistent with whether they're a firefighter or whether they're Correct. qualified as both? Correct. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You can continue. The second page contains all the same figures as the first page, only the starting firefighter wage is projected out through all five years. So each column has what the starting firefighter would make in that year. Because our turnover is an average of three people per year retire and we hire three new. So what we typically always have somebody at that lower range of our pay scale. We believe that the actual amount of the cost is a blend somewhere between these two pages, but for the sake of costing out this proposal, we did use the higher full paid firefighter wage, which is the far right column on that first page. Moving on to the third page, miscellaneous expenses and revenues. Disposable medical supplies was taken off of uh, the current provider's numbers, and that's at $30,000, and we did increase that by 3% each year. The fuel was estimated at 10 miles per call and multiplied by the 2,200 calls that we anticipate. And then there also was a small amount of savings figured into there for taking one fire rig out of service while we're running the, one of the ambulances. And that, again, was increased by 3% each year. Training cost was for uh, every other year refreshers for the paramedics and EMTs. And that was figured at $500 per new employee. The routine vehicle maintenance is $2,700. That was $900 for each vehicle of the three ambulances. And that was for uh, oil changes, windshield wipers, just the normal maintenance. And that again is increased by 3%. The non-routine vehicle maintenance, there's no number in the first three years because the vehicles would be under warranty. And then years four and five, we did add $1,200 each year for things that weren't covered under warranty. Ambulance insurance, again, is a number that we received from the city's insurance company, and that's at $800 per vehicle. And the liability insurance, again, uh, from the city's insurance company, that's $1,000. Our billing costs, we have a quote. A minute, Commander. Mm -hmm. Alderman Bulk. Uh, just a couple of questions about liability. 
Uh, is that the ambulance insurance? Is that liability on if something happens to the the vehicle itself? The ambulance insurance. The that is the line above it. The ambulance insurance. Okay, so that's if the ambulance gets in a wreck and has to be Correct. replaced. Yep. The liability insurance that's a thousand dollars. What is that insurance for? That's in addition to the city's liability policy that they now cover their employees for. That's putting the ambulance rider on on top of that. Okay. And is that, and I don't know if this question is more appropriate for Attorney McLean, and maybe this isn't the right time to ask that, but are we taking on an, an, an incredible amount more liability by taking the service on? And would that change our payment to however we pay for our insurance? All right, just to answer that from here. Uh, as far as I'm aware, Pacific Policy currently covers recover, uh, liability if we provided ambulance service in house. I believe a lot of the Civic uh, municipalities that are covered by Civic uh, are to run their ambulance service through, uh, through fire departments. And I believe, I looked at the policy today, uh, there are some exclusions, but uh, the the exclusions have exclusions for ambulance service. So uh, I haven't checked the civic, but it's my understanding that if we provided uh, city fire department based uh, ambulance service, that, that would currently be within the policy, which is paying premium for how it's got a uh, million dollars of coverage, and there's an $8 million umbrella. Okay. As far as liability, uh, certainly the more activities you engage in as a city, the more possibility you get for claims. Uh, medical area is one that is sort of right for that. Uh, you know, there are some exclusions, some protections. Recreational immunity is one uh, that may help to avoid paying out any insurance coverage. Also, the Civic policy, while we've got insurance, it's $100,000 uh, self-insured retention. In other words, we're out the first $100,000 for a plan. Then the insurance gets insured. But the fact that we're taking on so much more potential for disaster, that's all covered as you see it in the Civic, civic policy as it exists today. Well, up to $8 million. Right. Okay. And I think it's, uh, you know, that's in the aggregate. I believe it's $2 million per occurrence. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, please continue. The billing cost is a quote that we have from the Manitowoc Fire Department at $18 per bill. That's 18 times the 20, uh, roughly 2,100 calls, I believe, comes up with the 35,000. And that again is increased. Just a minute. <laughs> Alderman Bourne. Well, Commander Herman, finish your explanation on the uh, on the billing costs, and then I have a question. Okay. If you have anything else you wanted to add to that, or just that it's increased as we go down the year by the amount of projected increases in call volume. For that, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for that eighteen dollars, what exactly what services are Manitowoc? going to provide, uh, who's going to do the initial billing input into the Manitowoc system? Uh, is there going to have to be a person in your department that, ans that wants to ask, Mrs. Jones, that wants to ask why isn't her bill being paid by her insurance or Medicare? Kind of run me through the scenario of what we're going to get for the $18 and if you anticipate having to do anything locally. I'll refer that question to Commander Butler. As we, uh, as we understand it currently from Manitowoc Fire Department, um, they currently use a software program up there. They have people in-house for their billing. Um, the $18, basically, what we would have to do to input information into the system for billing is we use field data system. Um, it's basically a remote access to their billing system. Everything is done through Datalink. Um, all of the information is properly coded, sent directly to Manitowoc Fire Department, and uh, they would handle all of the uh, initial billing requests um, and the invoices and things that are sent out. Um, the only thing that's not really included in that system would be what the city would decide to do with bad debt collectibles. Um, we would be able to use a service of our choice, whether it's local or whatever, and then uh, that, that would be our decision how we handle that. Uh, who, would, who would do that locally then? I mean, would, 
would there be another clerical person that would, would handle that or going after bad debts? Uh, how would that be handled? We anticipate using an outside firm um, of the council's decision or choice. I mean, it's not really our decision to make um, whether, uh, whether the council would decide to use somebody locally or otherwise. Right, and the actual, the actual coding and the input is actually done by the paramedics. When they do a, um, when they fill out a run sheet, if they would actually go on a call, when they put that information into their computer, the information is automatically coded um, to meet the needs of Medicare, Medicaid, and all of the insurance companies, and, and that information is forwarded directly. So there'll be no, no additional personnel needed for our local billing service other than the outside private um, collectible agency. And you'd have, you would have policies established as to when uh, debts become old and when you want to put them out for collection and all that. That all has to be done as far as your ongoing policies, what you're going to develop then? Absolutely. That's, that's obviously out of my hands, but I fully expect that the council and the rest of our staff would have input into our philosophy on collection. And uh, there are certain things that you don't want to push too hard. You know, it's something that we would have to absorb as, as maybe a, a negative influence on the department or a negative uh, view by the public. Um, certainly that would be something we'd be very concerned about. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Bourne. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, would it be possible for Orange Cross to be the billing agent given the technology that you'd be using? That would be possible. Um, I guess if they wanted to give us a bid that is cheaper than the $18, I, we only went out and got one price, so I think before we did ultimately choose to use Manitowoc, we would shop that price around. Okay, thank you. Please continue, Commander Herman. The next line down is firefighter personal protective gear. That's what we refer to as the firefighter's turnout gear. His boots, his coat, his pants, and his helmet. That is at $2,500 times the four new employees. The reason that it's not included in any of the succeeding years is because that is done uh, as a normal part of the fire department budget when we have uh, three to four people retire and replace them every year. That's already included in our budget. Next line is EMS equipment and repair. That's if somebody drops a radio or drops one of the monitors. Um, that's for the repairing of that equipment. And again, we did... Uh, think that we were very cautious on that amount and, and did put a sufficient amount in there. Next line down is an amount that's only in the first year and that's to purchase a reserve ambulance, a fourth ambulance to be kept in the city. Uh, we did go out and look at what's available. There are ambulances available anywhere from $7,000 up to $50,000. We felt that $35,000 was a very fair amount to put into the expense portion. Next line down is the total miscellaneous expenses. Alderman Gisha. Just a quick question, <clears throat> uh, Commander, on this page, uh, FAP funds from state. Uh, can you explain uh, what that is, please? Uh, again, I'll turn that over to Commander Butler. The FAP funds are actually, um, they're funds used for reimbursing training costs and things like that from the state of Wisconsin. Um, they use a, uh, an equation to determine that and what individual service would get that. Um, they currently, those funds go out to ambulance service providers. Um, I believe the equation is something in the area of uh, three cents per capita of the response area. And then there's a flat fee that gets figured when they disperse the funds and then in addition to that, number of personnel. Um, and uh, we actually used uh, the $11,000, I believe, is a number that we got from Manitowoc Fire Department, given the average size of their response area and what we could generally expect for those. Are those funds currently not coming into our area, these state aids? That is correct. It, uh, they come currently to uh, the current provider uh, so because they are dispersed receives. only to the ambulance service provider. So Orange Cross currently receives some funds from the state? I believe that's correct, yes. Thank you. You may proceed. The next line below the FAP funds uh, where we have the question mark in, in that line is non-transport revenues and those are 
uh, when an ambulance responds and the person is not transported to the hospital, whether it's a diabetic call or, or some other call where you may be treated on the scene but not transported, um, there typically is a fee for that service. We had no way of knowing um, what that amount exactly is. Looking through uh, the current provider's financial numbers, it looked like it ranged anywhere from $4,000 to $8,000, but once again, being conservative, we did not include that in on our revenue projection. Moving on to the next page is our call volume projections. Um, we took these numbers from the fire department records and from the Quality Assurance uh, Commission. We did uh, factor in a 3% increase in call volume every year. Um, the past five years, the fire department has seen about a 4.4% increase in our call volume. Uh, Man City of Manitowoc is experiencing roughly the same. Uh, again, we were conservative in our numbers and figured in a 3% increase. The number that you see in that same box in the, the bold number, that is the actual uh, number of transports. Uh, what we're typically seeing is 15% of the calls the person is not transported to a hospital. So the bold number is the one that actually could be billed for. Alderman Clahunas. Thank you. Uh, I'm just asking, uh, based on the increasing numbers of calls each year, are you basing it on the, an aging population, or what? Uh, what means what? causes you to increase in numbers because the city is not increasing in population. What? Um, I guess I couldn't tell you exactly what the number is. We just uh, took that increase from going back five years and looking what has been happening in the past five years and from okay. talking to other cities to see what the, what the average has been. The next box down is where we uh, factor in the rate that is charged for the ambulance call. And again, we took the numbers off of the current provider's rate schedule, and we did freeze the rates for, from the year 2006 to starting in 2008. We kept the same rate. Going back seven years, the current provider has raised the BLS rates 105% in seven years and the ALS rates 64% in the last seven years. That's an average of actually higher than the 9.2%, but that's what we use to um, raise our rates as we project it out into the, into the future, again allowing with a two-year freeze of the rates. And as we'll show you uh, later on, we did also do some projections with um, projecting rates that did not increase by the 9.2% because we did not feel that that was a justifiable number. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do those rate increases that uh, Orange Cross has been experiencing, those rate increases have anything to do with any reduction in Medicare or medical assistant reimbursements? What's, what has been the trend on those reimbursements the last four or five years? Have they been staying the same? Have they been going down? What's the experience been? It's my understanding that that's a fixed rate for the Medicaid, Medicare, and the how much you raise the rates does not affect how much you get back from Medicaid, Medicare. Uh, that doesn't answer my question. The rate increases that Orange Cross has had now the last few years, what relation to those increases does uh, the Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement factor in? Has, has what the government's been reimbursing for Medicare, I understand it's $337 a call, has that been staying the same or has it been going up or down? What, and also with, with medical assistance, what's, what's the relationship between the rate increases and what we're getting from the government for those calls? 
that the Medicaid Medicare rate has been going up approximately 3% a year. Medicare and Medicaid? You're correct. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank All you. Right, thank you. Please go on. Moving on to the next box is a revenue projection based on the percentage of ALS and BLS calls. And from our, from our research with other departments and talking to Manitowoc, because our proposal is not taking in account interfacility transports, which are between nursing homes, which are almost always 100% Medicaid, Medicare, they expect us to see um, about a 60-40 a split. Is that correct? On the ALS, BLS? We figured in a 50-50 um, just to be conservative again. So if you multiply our amount of transported calls, which are the bold letters on the top, by the rates for BLS and ALS, you will come up with the numbers that are the pro revenue projection. Then the next box below that is the loaded mile revenue projection, and that is the amount of the charge for revenue based on the amount of miles between when you pick the person up and you get them to the hospital. We projected that to be three miles per call times the, in 2008 would be 1,951 calls, and that comes to the 58,530. And then we estimated a 25% bad debt, which is people that don't pay, which brings us to the 43,897. The reason we didn't figure in the 52% bad debt, which we do figure for every other call, is the Medicaid, Medicare reimbursement for mileage is almost always at 100%. Moving on to the next page, which is our projected revenues. If you multiply the revenue projections on the previous page by the 48%, and that's what we're uh, assuming is our, going to be our collection rate, only 48%, that is where you come up with our projected revenue. Again, that's increased as we move from year to year. And then again, below is carrying through the funding assistance, assistance program of 11,000. Alderman Gisha. Thank you. Sorry to stop you. You were kind of on a roll. Mm. Nobody had bothered you. It's for okay. A, while. <clears throat> a lot has been, I know I've received a lot of calls about it and emails, and you've now mentioned it a couple times, talking about not only the Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement, but bad debt and how all that clumps together basically in one big receivable or non collectible. Um, I've received communication that your an initial numbers of 15% all-inclusive <clears throat> were, were, were not accurate, and I think some of that was misinformation kicking around. Can you just for just a second focus in on the fact of how, it's my understanding that your projections are looking at 50, not of every dollar billed, we're only going to get 48, 48 cents out of. That's correct. When Manitowoc does not experience that percentage, correct? They are. They are at a higher rate. They are at a higher rate of collection. Collection. So, so uh, you're using a, a uh, safer number with using, a lot more cushion in it. We actually took, um, and I, I, I may have confused these numbers, but Manitowoc is projecting that we'll probably be at a 60 percent because we're not doing the transports between the nursing homes, which is always paid at the lower Medicaid Medicare rate. That we won't have as many of those as what they're seeing, so they're predicting we'll be at a 60-40. The 48% uh, collection rate we actually took right off of the current provider's document that they provided to council, I believe last Monday, stating that they are at a 48% collection rate, so that's what we used. We firmly believe it's going to be a little bit higher than that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, the FAP program, $11,000, we carried that through. The mileage revenue carried that over to this page. For a total 
projected revenue of $675,235. If you go down our employee costs of $271,000, and again, if you look back to the first page, that's column number one. That's at the bottom of there. And then our miscellaneous expenses of $130,218. Our equipment lease is of $78,269 is a backloaded lease of three brand new ambulances, um, a seven year lease program. That amount is due at the end of the year, so there aren't as much upfront costs. At the end of the seven years, it's a lease to own program. The ambulances are ours. So the total projected expenses is $479,487. When you subtract that from the $675,235, you come up with a projected total net revenue of $195,748. And unless there's any questions, I think I'll have Commander Butler hand out. And again, this is projected at the first year would be at the frozen 2006 collection rates. Um, the following figures are at a 9.2% rate increase, and we don't believe that that is a fair amount. And again, that would be subject to council approval. We have run projections out at increasing the rates by 3% and 5%. And again, that will show as a projected net revenue in the succeeding years. Yeah. Thank you. Um, question, how will you track this um, within the fire department budget? Um, you know, because sometimes the paramedics will be doing fire calls. How will you be able to show that this is where you're at, this is what we're doing, these are our expenses, this is our income? How will that be tracked? Do you have a separate accounting system you have set up for this, or how will you do that? That's why this is one of the easiest way to show whether or not this is going to make money or lose money. You already know what the fixed expense is for your fire department in this city. You'll be able to, see, we can see what our fixed expenses are for providing the additional service. Once you subtract that from the amount that is actually paid in, that's going to be your additional cost and or if, revenue. If I, can, if I can add, that's what, the city of Manitowoc did as well. And there was a, a great concern, obviously, when they took on that consolidated ambulance service that there would be um, um, very detailed accounting of what those additional costs and revenues are. So they actually separated out into to two separate budgets, their existing fire department operations and then what they called their consolidated operations. And they tracked their costs and revenues and um, have accounted for that separately over the past five years and have shown a, a, a positive revenue stream there, but they're uh, even discussing the possibility of, of uh, merging the two budgets together because they feel after tracking it for, for five years now or four years that they're comfortable um, knowing what those marginal costs actually are. And also one thing I, I might add um, in regards to the equipment lease, um, these, these leased ambulances are going to be state-of-the-art ambulances. We utilized um, the equipment list that Orange Cross Ambulance provided to the council last week um, to spec out uh, um, a fully equipped ambulance including uh, communications, technology, um, computer equipment to allow us to uh, essentially have a unit that's that's ready to go uh, upon uh, accepting uh, delivery. So um, all those costs are built into the lease program. Alderman Vanderbilt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time, but we're almost at the end and everybody's looking at these sheets. I, I do want to explain why my name isn't on this, the document that we're looking at tonight. It is because I was unable to look at the proposal before we had to get this document to Sue Richards. 
And uh, since Alderman Ryan Flesch is my vice chair, and he was able to look at it, we put him on the document instead. It, there was no other reason than basically for convenience. And um, since history shows we usually debate this here, and then we'll debate it on council floor also, in an attempt to maybe limit the debate here, I'll make a motion to uh, send items number five and six, those two resolutions, to council with a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second on the floor to send items four and five, well, the resolution items five and six to council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor of the motion say aye. Under discussion. Sorry, under discussion. Sorry. All right. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Uh, I have about seven issues listed on my piece of paper. Some are uh, philosophical issues, some are pragmatic, concrete, detail issues. So I'll start with a detail issue and then turn the floor over to someone else. And certainly we'll have a lot of questions voiced and a lot of information shared in this next half an hour to 45 minutes, I trust, or longer, perhaps. <clears throat> so one simple detail question is, um, if the fire department does begin service on January 1st, 2008. In effect, Orange Cross becomes a potential competitor for service within the city. There would be no reason why they could not so serve if they were first called. 911 calls would come directly to the fire department for response, but um, how big a factor might that competition be where people don't have an emergency but they have a need, and they have a tradition with Orange Cross and a trust with Orange Cross, and therefore they call, call Orange Cross instead of 911, and in effect then adversely affect the bottom line in revenue. That's certainly a possibility. Um, I've worked in systems where that's been the case before. Um, it is certainly within the right of every individual in the city, every citizen, to call who they would like to have for their service. Um, 911 is a system that we've been taught from little on. In the case of an emergency, you call for 911. Um, again, I accept the fact that there would be, and we certainly agree, that there is that potential. Uh, people have a relationship with that organization, and if they're still in place, they're absolutely welcome to call. Um, we still advocate the use of 911 for emergency calls, and uh, if there was some sort of a concerted effort by the current provider to actually advertise opposite of that, um, that would be viewed in my eyes as unethical and unnecessary. Um, 911 is absolutely the system in place, and uh, um, in that bad situation, you certainly don't want to confuse people, uh, whether they be elderly or injured, or that's a bad time for anybody. Um, so again, that's everybody's right, but um, there's really no way to project that at this point. Alderman Berhasselt. Thank, thank you, Mrs. Chair. Um, I guess we've got a number of personnel here from Orange Cross tonight. I think it may be appropriate to open the floor at this time, and I'd like to make such a motion to open the floor to Orange Cross to answer to any of these numbers, these pieces of information. Second. There's a motion and a second under discussion. Wait a minute. <laughs> Who just buzzed? <laughs> Where are we here? Gisha. Yes, Alderman Gisha. Thank you. Um, I appreciate the motion to, to open the floor. Um, I'm just afraid that this gets into a situation of Orange Cross good, Fire Department bad, Fire Department good, Orange Cross bad, and I don't think that serves a discussion like this at all. Um, I think that... Uh, it's, it's their night to do their thing, and, um, and it, the, this proposal has to stand on its own merits or fall on its own merits. Um, and I would like to see a, a clear discussion on this. And I, too, Alderman Manny, have a few more questions and, and things on, on my plate as we move along with this. And 
I would like to use the time to extract just as much information about this proposal and deal with this proposal. We do not have a proposal from Orange Cross, except an extension of the same contract for 10 years. I think we pretty well know where that, that stands, and that's, that's excellent. But I would just prefer to keep it focused on this for those reasons. <laughs> Alderman Bourne. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the equipment lease, the first, the first payment on the equi equipment lease would be during 2008. Is that correct? Uh, excuse me. We have a motion to oh. open the floor, which is taking precedence oh, okay. over. I'm sorry. And we have to vote on that motion unless we have further discussion. Um, Alderman Manny. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would prefer to have all of our questions asked first from the council floor and then perhaps open that up to Orange Cross for their comments basically uh, related to technical evaluation of that which is before all of us on the fire department proposal. Thank you. Oops. Time on Sorry. the motion. Thank you. Alderman Verhasselt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I can certainly appreciate what Alderman Gish has stated. However, I mean, as a decision maker for my constituents, I think it's always important to hear both sides of any issue. Um, I don't know how I could make a quality decision otherwise, so I guess I'd like to, um, I can agree with Alderman Manny that if, if we can move ahead with answering the questions directed at the fire department, that's fine, but at some point in this meeting, I would like to hear from Orange Cross because the motion on the floor is a fairly powerful motion in that we're providing a favorable recommendation back to the council in the next seven days. And I think it deserves, uh, the timeliness of that motion deserves that we hear from Orange Cross sooner rather than later. Okay, thank you. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chair. As the motion was stated, I would not uh, agree with it if it was stated that one representative from Orange Cross, if we would hear if we would have a question answer period with them, I would be in favor of it. But at Orange Cross, in general, we could have five, six people up here. But if, if we would state that one representative, then I would agree to the motion. Thank you. Alderman Gisha. I want to thank Alderman Manny for stating it better than I, uh, and, and, and uh, Alderman Verhassel for, for allowing me to clear it. I would agree with Alderman Manny. If we can get through this, I have no issue with, with uh, gathering information from Orange Cross. That's why I was there at their office at 7.30 Friday morning. <clears throat> uh, they're wonderful people with a lot of great data and information. I'd love to hear from them even more than I did last Friday. But if we could, if, if you wouldn't mind amending your thoughts to ending one and then starting another, if that would be appropriate, I, would, I, I agree with Alderman Manny. That would be a wonderful opportunity. OK. Alderman Bauk. I was going to uh, support Alderman Verhassel in that we would want to hear from them before moving on because this is a, such a powerful uh, issue before the city and the city cares a great deal about it. I think we've come to a place where we can vote no now uh, and then invite them up later. Alderman Verhassel. Thank you. Again, so are we holding off on the motion to move ahead because the motion on the floor, the other motion, the previous motion is to move ahead with a favorable recommendation is the suggestion that we vote on that motion and then come back to Orange Cross because that would seem to defeat the purpose of putting them on the back end of the discussion. If we're going to decide on sending a favorable recommendation onwards, then I think Orange Cross needs to come before that. Is that maybe Alderman Gisha, could you clarify, is that your intention or your, your hope? Good question. <laughs> um, you're right, there does seem to be some conflict uh, based on Alderman Van de Wiel's motion to move it ahead with a favorable um, without hearing from Orange Cross. I, I would assume from a parliamentary standpoint we have to go back and get rid of that. Uh, and then my suggestion would be to finish with the questions from all the aldermen for the fire department and then bring up Orange Cross and then perhaps move back to Alderman Van de Wiel's proposal if that makes any sense to anybody. That's, that's perfectly <laughs> still discussion. If, if Alderman Van de Wiel oh. is amenable to that. Alderman Van der Wiel. Thank you, Madam Chair. If I'm wrong with this statement, anyone is free to correct me, but I believe that as a chair, you could hold the motion to open the floor till the fire department has done discussion. Then as part of discussion on my motion, 
then we can move to open the floor and it could all just be part of the discussion because opening the floor is just part of the discussion anyway. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in discussion. We, so we still have the motion on the floor to open to Orange Cross. So we will hold that motion until we are finished with the discussion from the fire department. Yes. Is that okay? All right. And we're holding our motions for a little bit. At uh, some point as part of our presentation, um, our medical director, Dr. Coolis, is here, and uh, we'd like to invite some comments from him as well. Um, Dr. Coolis, would you be available to do that at this time? Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of being up here to speak this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Louis Coolis. I'm a clinical cardiologist and I've been in this community about going on 15 years. I've had the opportunity to be involved with emergency care specifically for cardiac patients uh, during this time. Um, and I've been involved with Orange Cross in one way, shape, or another on and off during this period of time. I became medical director for the fire department and I know this is a very emotionally charged uh, issue this evening. But I became a medical director of the fire department because from my standpoint, while it's a system that does provide care, it's not an optimal system. And I think that what you have before you this evening is an opportunity to change the paradigm in which care is delivered in this community. And what I did see this evening was everybody going through line by line of what things cost, what's going to be the projection, how are things going to run. This is accountability and this is what you should have from the folks who are providing your care in the community. And this is something that I think was actually positive this evening. What I see here is that you're already paying for the talents of these gentlemen. So to say this doesn't cost you anything is really not completely accurate. It does cost you because you are paying for the salaries for the benefits of these gentlemen. You are paying for the resources through which they work and you are paying in some degree for their talents. So to me, and I'm very simple and I look at things simply, you might as well get the most bang for your buck and, ha and utilize them to their fullest extent. And I think that we, the community, should look at developing a system by which you bring these gentlemen into the fold to provide you the full level of resources for the money that you're paying as taxpayers. I've seen this firsthand. I really wonder how many of you in this room have ever seen emergency care delivered right in front of your eyes. I've seen it several times in my own facility where we have one, two, three groups of people showing up to provide care for the patient. And well, this person can't do this because we have to wait for this person to show up. And then this person can't do it because we have to wait for this person to show up, which ultimately is Orange Cross. And really what this is, is a system of inefficiency. It's inefficiency. It's a system of redundancy. And in healthcare, that doesn't fly very well. It means cost, it means not necessarily always the best outcomes possible. So as you look at this, this, this whole issue this evening, I think you need to separate out a little bit the emotional issues and sit down and look at what is it that you're asking. Look what you're already paying for and ask yourself, are you getting the most bang for the buck? And separate out what's the cost of healthcare versus what's the price of healthcare because that's really what you're looking at. It's not just the bottom line that you're seeing in this proposal tonight, but what else are you getting for the money? And are you optimizing those resources? And that's what the people of Sheboygan are asking, and really, that's what the people of Sheboygan County should be asking. So that's all I have to say. I keep it simple. I know you guys got a lot to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Manny. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with that fine introduction, that brings up an issue that I'm very concerned about, and that is the uh, apparent and oftentimes real duplication of services that we're currently providing, which is the inefficiency. Uh, many firemen are full paramedics and cannot offer the talent that they have when they arrive first on site because they're not so authorized to go beyond a certain point. So in those situations, and I think uh, the fire department has statistics and Orange Cross has statistics that would be helpful for us to understand uh, who's there first, how often, things along those lines. But there's also a further issue here, I think, complicating the whole territory, 
and that is uh, the response methodologies that we're using for 9-11 calls. And I need further education about that. I believe the monikers would be EMD that would uh, define or, s or summarize the response uh, prioritizing that's an industry standard, perhaps. Um, I'm wondering if a sharper use of that methodology might erase some of the current inefficiencies. Um, I'm just throwing this out there as the devil's advocate. If we didn't change uh, current status, would utilizing EMD or the appropriate um, procedural policy, would that better improve the efficiency of what we're currently doing? So I'm beginning to get nebulous about this, but you know at least what I'm talking about now. So some comments along these lines would be helpful, I think. Comment. Well, I think it, in either system, whether it's our existing one or uh, change the fire department proposal, fire-based ambulance, um, the EMD system probably would accomplish what you're talking about. And I don't know that it would particularly be beneficial in either one or the other system. Um, what I look at is, and I think Dr. Coolis touched on it very well, is that we currently have a vast pool of resources available to the community that are untapped. We currently have 40, 42 um, EMTs, 42, or excuse me, two IVs, techs, and uh, 11 paramedics that at this point in time are only allowed to work to the um, level of first responder. And to me, that's it's, it's a, again, a large untapped pool of resources. It, to me, it's a, it's a crime that we're not fully utilizing these people. Um, the fire service has changed so much over, over the years that paramedic firefighters is, is the rule, not the exception. Um, Sheboygan is one of the, the odd ducks out, I guess, if you want to look at it, as far as fire-based fire EMS in the state. Uh, you know, I've heard different numbers, but roughly 50 of the 53 major cities in the state of Wisconsin are running fire-based ambulance services at this time. So th we're not looking to do something that is unique to the service, and we're looking to actually fully utilize and, and realize the resources that we do have available now that we're not able to, to realize because of the limitations based on provider licenses and such. Thank you. Alderman Clayhunas. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, the one thing, the EMD, which is, means emergency medical dispatch, we, I, do we have the software and the capability of doing that right now? There's a the dispatch, does anybody can speak to that from dispatch? That, in other words, when a call comes in, there's a series of questions that the person would be asked, and it would, um, uh, what do you call it, um, triage the case. So that, in other words, this is, this is, a, this is a, a case where there's a danger of fire or rescue as well as a danger of health and injury. Or this is just a case of an injury and, um, you know, maybe it's, you know, someone scraped their knee. Uh, someone can go into a panic for that. That somehow that this could be delineated so that we don't have three vehicles running to the scene of a skinned knee uh, because it's been triaged out that this is all we need. Can we do that now? Are we working toward that? It's my understanding that the City Police Department Dispatch Center has some documentation and some um, items to assist them in making those decisions on there. I do not believe that they are officially trained and in place to do EMD right now at this point. Um, they do the best they can with what they have to work with. I do believe it. Um, within the police department budget has been somewhat cost prohibitive for them. Um, that is something that we also would like to take a look at. On a more uh, casual, not quite as formal level of EMD, um, bringing the ambulance service into the control of the fire department here in the city allows us the ability to, between active units and response units, we can send the appropriate, by just conversation, face to face, or by our shift commander, um, appropriating the proper resource based on how the call comes in. So um, in a contractual situation, um, 
you're kind of left to whatever it comes in. You have to respond a certain way to it, and that's how we respond as Code 3 to those types of calls, um, whether they're emergency or whether they're in question as being emergency. So um, to answer your question, I guess going back, I do not believe they are officially in place to do EMD, um, but with further training, that would certainly be something we could do. Alderman Bulk. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with regard to the competitive pressure question. Are there benchmarks out there? Are there municipalities that have uh, fire provided ambulance and a commercially available service? And can we know what that, uh, how often people dial the commercial service instead of 911? Is that a number we can know better than we do right now? <clears throat> I know the Milwaukee area is one where there is, has been some issues with that. And um, uh, I, I guess I can't answer any specific question on how many calls are diverted but I can just tell you from 28 years of experience when people want someone to respond they call 911 they don't go to the refrigerator to look for refrigerator magnets or or uh, page through a phone book to to find that number um, to call a, a special provider uh, I would believe that um, we probably get more 911 calls than we should uh, people call 911 for all different reasons uh, that aren't emergencies. I would expect that if there was a, a, a advertising campaign by the private provider, um, there might be some impact on some of the borderline calls. I don't believe that the 911 system would be compromised as such. Um, I think it would be... Um, not in the best interest of the hospitals and the private provider to do something like that. And uh, again, ethically, I would question whether that be the, the right process to go. Um, and that's something that they're going to have to make a decision on. But specifically, um, how much of an impact uh, that would have, I can't, I can't answer that. Okay, and for, but for non-emergent cases, or if it's a, it's a transport, for instance, there have to be statistics out there because you guys are asking to go into business. And in business, we, we use numbers. And, and so I would encourage you to find out what that number is, uh, work with the Orange Cross people to find out how often non-emergent numbers get dialed. Uh, someone mentioned there's a relationship in this town with Orange Cross. And in the business world, that equity means something. And I would just like to know what that equity is worth in the town of Sheboygan. And that will help us all feel better about the value of your numbers. But for this proposal only, we're talking about emergency calls, just 911 calls. Very good. So it is. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Gisha. You answered a lot of my questions. I had three pages full, and I thank you for the, the presentation. And I also want to thank uh, Dr. Koulis for addressing the council and also for reminding me that it isn't always just about numbers. I tend to get wrapped up in that and because uh, we've been talking numbers on this for the last couple weeks. But it is about efficiencies, but it's about the people who call 911, and uh, whether it be Orange Cross, because they've said wonderful things to me about the fire department, whether it's the fire department who said wonderful things to me about Orange Cross, These, uh, this is a group in this room of caring people who have cared for this, the citizens of Sheboygan for a long time, and, and uh, Dr. Kulis brought that back to me. So that being said, now I'm going to ask about some numbers. <laughs> um, what if you're wrong? Perhaps you can address, there was a word guarantee, and I always like that, uh, that was in the original resolution. Perhaps you can explain that a little bit. I think it's the last, um, and I don't have the resolution okay. in front of me, but I believe it's the last, um, therefore. Um, we have given the council a guarantee, and this is not something that um, the three of us sat together here and just came up with. Um, I went to many, many seminars five years ago, um, when this proposal came forth, and it was something that was pitched to uh, fire departments as a way of integrating this service by giving a guarantee that says, if we do lose money providing this service, you can take it out of our budget. Now, the other half of what I learned at seminars was they told us to... You should stop right there. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go on because uh, to tell the council that if we do make money, it stays in the fire department budget. We chose not to do that. <laughs> what happened in other cities was the fire department made quite a bit of money providing this service, and their budget was rich. Other city departments were jealous, and it caused nothing but problems. We gave the guarantee to the 
to the council because we researched this so well, um, we don't believe it's going to lose money. That's why we gave the guarantee. If it does, we'll take it out of our fire department budget. Doesn't come out of the, out of the DPW, doesn't come out of the PD, comes out of the fire department budget. If we do make a revenue, which we are sure we're going to, it goes into the city general fund or wherever the council feels fit to put it. Looking, thank you. Looking throughout Wisconsin, are there other cities in Wisconsin? What percentage, I guess, of cities in Wisconsin, uh, like size or, uh, or at least generally the size of Sheboygan, have a county versus private run ambulance service? County? County is. Are we the oddball because we don't have it, or are we the oddball because we might? Are the city-run ambulance service? Mm -hmm. We're the oddball because we don't. The only other two that do not are Appleton and La Crosse, and La Crosse is um, currently in the same part of the process that we are of okay. looking at switching it over. Uh, a speaker, and I'm sorry, I forget her name, from uh, Orange Cross in the opening announcements uh, kind of mentioned... Um, uh, the landmark fire. Maybe we can use that as an example where instead of having Orange Cross coming in the fire department, now we have the fire department slash ambulance service coming in mass with really only four additional guys. Using that as kind of a worst case scenario when it comes to people, because there was you know hundreds of people that had moved around. Um, maybe you could address how a change like this would or wouldn't affect your response to that type of emergency. Uh, emergency response staffing is, is really based on risk management. There is no city anywhere that could afford to staff a fire department to fight the landmark fire every day of the year. That just doesn't happen that often. Um, if we take on this service, our response will be changed, will be altered to provide for dedicated response to med calls and dedicated response to fire calls. We are going to have to supplement our fire service, our fire calls with a more aggressive callback and overtime procedure to make sure that we have enough people for that. Okay. The, uh, and I'm sorry to keep rambling on, but uh, I guess that's what this is for. Um, there's been some talk and I've been, received some communication regarding county service and uh, if, for instance, the county came to the city of Sheboygan and said, hey, why don't we uh, why don't we contract with the city, for instance, for ambulance service? Does that possibility exist? I believe that's part of the resolution. We did leave the door open to that. We are willing to expand into that area. Um, obviously, the system would have to be expanded with it. Uh, speaking of that resolution, I'd like to throw an idea at you. And this would be potentially in the form of an amendment if, in fact, this moves through and onto the council floor and that would be an amendment um, stating that beginning January 1, 2008 and ending December 1 or 31, 2012, a hiring freeze is to be in place for the Sheboygan Fire Department. This freeze can only be altered if the geographic service area of the fire department and ambulance service were to be expanded, hence county service. Uh, your reaction to such an amendment? If you're referring to a hiring freeze, meaning that uh, our staffing levels will be frozen at what they are at plan at 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 this plan on January 1st. I think that would be totally appropriate. I think we're comfortable looking at the the system as it exists now, or as it exists the way we're proposing it, um, with the staffing levels that we're proposing that we would be able to provide that service during that time frame at those service levels. Just a couple final questions having to do with some of the uh, great comments we had by at the citizen input side. Um, the, uh, the frantic action that was noted or the uh, haste, I appreciate your timeline. I know those things are tedious to go through and it's hard to follow sometime, but from what you described to me, not only has this frantic pace, pace been going on for about 15 years, would that be the, the, the Sheboygan version of frantic pace? I would guess. Okay. Is that fairly accurate? 15 years worth of... Actually, it's longer than 15. It goes back to, to 1988 and maybe even before that. But uh, you know, more actively, we've, we've pursued this. And like I had said, prepared ourselves uh, 
for this for a long period of time. Um, one of the, the system benefits to moving forward with our proposal is that um, you know one of the positives of the fire-based DMS is that we have a great uh, history of retention of employees and and the idea that this system not only is going to incorporate our existing people at the current levels that they are but that it will grow to be a system where you'll have many more trained paramedics in the system than what we have current. If you look at the, the way Oshkosh um, proceeded with their development over many, many years, is that you know they started with a paramedic ambulance service and evolved over time with attrition of employees to, to provide a first response paramedic service that the first unit on scene is able to, to start paramedic treatments and the transport becomes almost secondary in that um, those, those abilities and capabilities are there on first response. And that's how we look at the system expanding over, over the years. Um, initially, we're going to be able to upgrade our first response level, like we had said earlier, to, to at least an EMT level from, from all of our first response vehicles in addition to the ALS ambulance. But eventually that whole system will slide and move toward the paramedic level and I think it will be a great benefit to the community and, and the area actually to have that resource available that is not available now. Final point, um, well at least for the moment. Um, I'm sorry to hear that your timeline which I believe uh, you noted over the last about 13 months with dealing with a lot of other entities to kind of bring this forward. Uh, I'm very sorry to hear that for whatever reason uh, somebody backed out or decided it was not in their interest or for whatever reason. Um, I, I don't know why and I guess it really doesn't matter why. It happened and we're here. Um, I also don't appreciate and sometimes you get information where people are making some assumptions. One assumption is and has been uh, touted and sent to writing, I think, to every single alderman, and that is that Manitowoc really, you guys are wrong, Manitowoc really doesn't make any money. And, uh, and I'd like you to address that. That's been stated uh, several times to me. Uh, as recently as last Friday afternoon, we had a phone conversation with the Manitowoc finance director, and it was asked point blankly to him, strictly from a financial standpoint, are you still happy that the Manitowoc Fire Department took up this service and his answer was absolutely it's bringing in positive revenue. And you do note that, I don't know if that's been released to the, the public, but a nice letter here from Manitowoc and their finance director and so forth. Um, uh, that's all the questions I have, just a quick comment and that is uh, regardless of the, end, the result of this, um, having a department come forward like this <coughs> to propose to be more efficient to propose to be revenue enhancing and to go through the work that you guys did is something, this isn't necessarily a challenge to every department head, but something I would love to see more often. Um, so your other department heads are going to be ticked at you because you, you now put them in the spotlight. But uh, I, I appreciate, regardless of what happens, the, the quality of, of work because I have run your numbers 15 different ways. And I'm confident your numbers are accurate, if not understated. Um, so from a number, strictly number standpoint, uh, they are very good. You have some advantages over Orange Cross, as described by, by yourself as well. And that, that It's unfair, but it's true. We already own the bodies. We already own the buildings. We already own the mechanics. We already own this. And that does, in this particular instance, put a uh, public sector company at a disadvantage. So, Regardless of that, I want to thank you for the work you've put into this and the dedication. Thank you very much. And I think if I can add to the uh, perceived haste to this, uh, that was never our intent. Um, the reason that we have a timeline is it takes approximately six months to build an ambulance. We're getting up to that six <clears throat> months before the end of the year and we need to get those vehicles in place here so our paramedics have time to train on them before we actually put them on the street. So that's why our timeline is what it is. Thank you. Next is Alderman Manny. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Two things. 
The first is a question related to um, flexibility and response when you're overtaxed and personnel needs call-ins. Um, how much emergency latitude do you have with numbers? Um, what size emergency perhaps could you respond to if necessary with callbacks? Maybe something concrete like that would help us uh, hold on to that and understand it. Uh, every day half of our off-duty firefighters are on call. So those are available to us immediately and we also have mutual aid packs with all the surrounding community fire departments. Second question. It's a broader question related to the county an ongoing service that Orange Cross would be immediately providing for county 911 calls. Um, the question would be, and maybe you can't answer this directly, but we are a part of the county and their costs are also our costs. And the quality of service that Orange Cross provides is also our concern. So in that broader context, what quality of service will they be able to maintain for county residents uh, with cost constraints, with reduced call volumes and thus reduced revenues. They'd be going through downsizing. Perhaps it's very difficult to project, but I think at least we need to note that reality and consider its impact. Finally speaking, we are taxpayers for the county service as well, whether that be just or not. Uh, I think that's a question you probably need to ask them. But again, um, our proposal calls for an alternative of we're here if you need us for the county. Okay. Uh, just to clarify one thing, I'd, I've had some discussions with people that um, so often we use the term ambulance and county and things like that. But uh, when we refer to the county, we simply refer to the surrounding communities that are within the current responders response district. We're not. We're not anticipating entire counties, obviously other ambulance services within the county to provide that service as well. So the immediate areas surrounding uh, the city of Sheboygan that are within the reach of a uh, legitimate response are the areas we're talking of when we speak of the county. Alderman Montemayor. <laughs> thank, thank you, Chairman Meyer. Um, ha having talked with um, Commander Butler and gone to EMS meetings, I found, I've learned that um, there are other fire department ambulances operating in this county, and I'm sure Commander Butler can tell us exactly what areas in Sheboygan County are already covered by other fire department ambulances. Well, there's actually a combination of fire department and private service ambulances. Uh, Plymouth Ambulance um, covers their service area toward the west side of the county. Northwest part of the county actually has a, a portion that is uh, covered by Keel Ambulance. Um, currently under some discussion at the EMS Council level regarding Plymouth Ambulance's response to that area as well um, because their service has been upgraded. Oostburg provides their own ambulance service and uh, Random Lake Fire Department also provides their own ambulance service and uh, City of Plymouth uh, Fire Department also has an ambulance. It's currently not the primary response ambulance for that area but um, they do respond if necessary in that area as well. Yes, thank you. Alderman Ryan. Thank you. Um, this is a thorny issue to say the least. Um, philosophically, you hate to take a private sector enterprise and turn it into a public entity. Um, however, I, I would like to see some more numbers from Orange Cross. I, I believe that the Sheboygan Fire Department, I commend you on really sticking your necks out. You're putting your reputations on the line, and you may be putting your careers on the line in order to do this. That's commendable. Because if you get in a situation where this is not making money, and your department cannot provide proper service because you're not getting any more funding, for you to put this together is commendable to say the least. Um, that said, I guess the big question is, are you going to provide the same level of service as Orange Cross 
or a better level of service in the future. Um, and is it going to make money, that not being said? When the landmark fire, uh, which was a couple months ago, what percentage of your reserves were called in from the fire department? People on call that were not currently on duty. Was it? Half of our on call crew came in, which that consists of actually 25% of our off duty people. So only 25% of your off duty people. So you still had people in reserve. We still had three quarters of our off duty people were still not called in. Okay. Um, I have the Manitowoc numbers here, and actually I think your numbers are conservative on your revenues. Um, I would like to see more solid numbers on Orange Cross and what, you know, we've, we've got some very vague figures here on what Orange, what, you know, actual Orange Cross revenues, their, their percentage of collection, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would like to see those before this goes to the council this coming, this next Monday for vote, if uh, they could provide those to us, because I, the numbers that we have here are very vague. Um, I believe the numbers that you have provided your, your estimates um, are in line. I think they are conservative. I don't think they're inflated whatsoever. I think you can realize these numbers. but. You know, it's, it, it's a big issue. I think we do need to utilize what we have in this city. Um, we are in a budget shortfall, to say the least. If, by your numbers, uh, you can be an asset to the revenues of the city, I believe that's a good thing. Um, it doesn't appear that Staffing issues will be a problem if only 25% of your people on reserve were called in for the landmark fire. But I would like to hear from Orange Cross because they have 40 employees that if this happens, uh, they will still be covering the county, but it's my understanding that the majority of their revenues are from the city. And the question is, well, provided that this council grants the Sheboygan Fire Department uh, the contract. Will we in turn be subsidizing the county for Orange Cross? Uh, will they survive? Or if they do not, will the Sheboygan Fire Department be able to cover those areas of the county be able to offer that service? Um, and that's why I think we do uh, need to hear from Orange Cross. That's all. Thank you. I think uh, just to speak to, you, you bring up the numbers of our proposal and as three people that sit up here and have served this community for collectively probably 60, 70 years, I don't know what it is, I hate to bait myself here, but um, it's hard for us to just look at this as a numbers proposal because it's our belief that we can make a good system even better by putting us into it. And we also believe that this really would be the beginning to shared services to the surrounding communities. It's really just the start. Thank you. And I would like to ask Mr. Isbell if he would get the numbers that Alderman Ryan is requesting. Could I get the details of numbers I can want? Could you be more specific? Well, you can talk after the meeting and, and get that arranged. Thank you. Alderman Vanderwill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to touch on some things that Alderman Gish had said. But um, to Alderman Ryan, I think I still have the original proposal from five years ago from Orange Cross. <laughs> and uh, five years ago, rumors and misinformation were a constant force in, in the community. And the longer we put this off, the more it will continue. And uh, I wanted to touch on the landmark issue again. Because I've gotten people asking me questions about it in the community, and and I'll just ask you a question, and you can agree or disagree. If we have a landmark fire type again, will the ambulance be a priority? Will you make sure it's staffed so that we can, um, so so it can be used at that time? 
and you will you use mutual aid if you need it? Um, again, you know, the landmark is probably a once in a lifetime thing, but we can't say it'll never happen again because it may. Um, we will always have our dedicated medic units for EMS responses. What occurred and what's been spread around during that fire was that we had no vehicles available. That's true. We didn't have any vehicles available for first response. And that may happen again if there's a big fire. That's no different. But we will have our medic units available to run on ambulance calls. Alderman Wangaman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, we've been tossing a lot of numbers around tonight. Uh, it's Alderman Balk said before, in business, of course, numbers are what makes things go, you know. And I'm a little bit concerned that there's such a wide difference between the numbers from the fire department and numbers from Orange Cross. Uh, as far as revenue goes, it, it looks like it's quite a bit of difference. And uh, I guess I would like to see an answer to that. I've been inundated with uh, sheets of numbers and I've got a whole bunch of stuff here from Orange Cross and so forth. And uh, when it comes to looking all these things, I gotta admit, I'm not the brightest candle on the cake, but uh, I would like to see some clarification as to why there's such a, a wide difference. Well, first of all, one number we're gonna to have to look at is our, our paper budget for this year because we've, we've killed a lot of trees going through this process. Um, uh, Commander Herman, would you like to, to comment on? Um, I, I think our revenue projections are actually lower than Orange Cross's because we were so conservative. Um, and I do have their numbers, which I've looked at, and I'm very confident that um, when we've run them, ours are very close to what theirs are when we get down to the final figure. Alderman Bulk. I would like to uh, discuss the potential for, that Alderman and Ryan brought up for, there are a couple of things that could happen when Orange Cross focuses on the county. One, there could be uh, not enough businesses to sustain their business model and they will need, a, uh, they will need money from the county uh, to supplement that, to keep, them, uh, to keep them operating. That would end up in a de facto tax increase on Sheboygan City taxpayers because the county would have to raise the taxes that city residents pay. So are you prepared? I know you have uh, something modeled out. Are you prepared to be able to offer county residents a competing business model that makes it so the city of Sheboygan taxpayers will not have to supplement the county the potential that Orange Cross goes away, you pick up that business. Does that model still, does it still make money? The manning and the ambulances that you would need to, to, to man that? Does that still make money at a rate that is more competitive than Orange Cross? Uh, we did run those numbers on taking over the entire system and we have assured the county that if what you're explaining does come to play, that we would be able to offer the system to them, the service to them without um, a subsidy. And yes, we did run the numbers and there is sufficient revenue projected profit in there for us to do that system also. And does that make more money? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. And the other question or a comment I'd like to make is there's this other, there are all kinds of numbers uh, running out there, some of them accurate, some of them not. Another number that's out there is that the city of Manitowoc lost somewhere between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars last year. And I know Alderman uh, Gisha has some insights on that because it deals with his area of expertise. Do you want to explain to a no, do you want to explain to a Sheboygan City taxpayer who believes that we are engaging in a money losing activity uh, why that number is false for the city of Manitowoc this year? Well, don't quote me on this, but I too uh, reviewed Manitowoc's numbers. They're right here. Um, it, uh, it, it seems to me that what they did financially was, well, first of all, the fire department proposal shows capitalizing the ambulance over a seven year period through lease. Uh, in other words, you pay an end payment each year, let the revenue stream catch up, time to pay, write it out the check, do that for seven years. At the end of the seven years, you pay them a buck, you own the ambulance. Uh, Manitowoc went and was originally going to do that. And then they decided the revenue stream was sufficient and exceeding per their letter here, their projection. So they decided to pay for it all in the first year or in, during that time period rather than amateurize it out or uh, capitalize it over a longer period of time. So they took 
their money and they thought it's tracking well, let's just pay it all off now and get it off the books. Does that make any sense? Perfect sense. Companies do it all the time and it's a very fair practice. And I just, I just really am disappointed that there are people out there who would use that number because it's an irresponsible number to use to say Manitowoc lost $400,000 last year. They made an accounting choice that was in their financial interest, and on the books it appears that they lost $400,000, but it was an accounting choice, just like a family might choose to pay off their car early or their, their house payment uh, a few months early. That, that was a very sound financial choice, and it shouldn't reflect uh, poorly on our, uh, uh, the fire department uh, and the fire chief. Uh, that number shouldn't be used against them when it's really a false accounting number. Thank you. Do you have any more comments? That would... No, thank you. Okay. Alderman Heideman. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, there are 50 other communities that have a ambulance service within their fire department. Uh, now, we're, we're talking about Manitowoc, and that's fine because they're just north of us, but of those other 50 communities, do they all make these projections? Do they, do, do they all get the same level of income into their budget, or is it, are there some, or what percentage of those communities are actually paying for that service? Because the majority, if not all, of those cities have had the ambulance and the fire department together for so long, it's virtually impossible to separate it out to see which one is drawing the revenue and which one is costing. Every fire department across the state cost the city money. So it's hard to project if it's been melded together for so long, it's hard to separate the two out, where that's why we've used Manitowoc as a comparison because they were able to separate those amounts out because they had an existing fire department and added an additional ambulance service to it and that's why it is so, it's easier and cleaner for us to be able to do it by um, starting up that separate account to track income and expenses. Okay, so then in 2008, we're expected to get this additional income in for the, for the next five years, but then in those other communities, does it start costing them money? I believe if it was costing them money, they wouldn't be in the business. I, I, would, I would think so too. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've, <clears throat> I've got several questions. I'm going to go back to the one I was going to ask originally. Uh, we have the ambulance lease uh, cost for 2008 at $78,269. Uh, that should be able to that should be able to be paid out of the revenue streams for the ambulance uh, for, from 2008. The resolution that was before the Finance Committee, and I was unable to attend finance on Friday night, I was out of town, so perhaps Alderman Gisher or Alderman Clayunas can, can, uh, can give me this information. If we can wait to pay this lease payment until 2008 of the 78269, uh, it seems to me that this resolution for the $500,000 for the transfer could be adjusted because apparently I, th I think some of the thought was that we were going to be purchasing ambulances and we would have that huge un up upfront cost, which apparently we'll no longer have. And what was the rest of the five hundred thousand dollars for? And should we adjust? Should we adjust the uh, the request of the five thousand five hundred thousand dollars downward because of the lease payments? I can take that. Um, we did have a meeting with the city finance director, Mr. Gebhardt, and he wanted the opportunity to, to explore whether it was better off in the city's side to purchase versus lease. So he wanted to leave his options open, and that's why that amount was put at that. And the additional amount over, actually, I think the purchase price of three ambulances is about $420,000. That additional amount was um, a couple of the disposable supplies, band-aids, whatever, and also the first three months of salary for those additional four firefighters to cover that before our revenue stream began coming in. But no, Jim, to clear up your... City of Sheboygan, they currently obviously respond to the 9-11 calls. Uh, they do SWAT standby, fire standby, drug enforcement standby, 
and hazmat standby, will your services be doing those additional standbys besides the just the 9-11 calls? Yes. Some additional services that they provide, which they call private party calls, including cancer patients to treatment, dialysis, doctor appointments, critical care standbys, hospice care, uh, interfacility facility uh, transports, nursing home transports, IV starts, return home, uh, Road America standby, contracted medical transports, contracted sports, sport coverage, citywide confirmation, uh, medic alert responses, ALS on-scene services, BLS on-site on-scene services, and invalid assist. Uh, would you, would you, are you going to provide any of those services and are any of them potential money makers? Many of those things that are listed on there we're, we are already responding to or standing by at. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, on the same train of thought that was brought up before on whether somebody could choose to call, not call 911 and call Orange Cross for an emergency transport, the citizens will have the same option of Interfacility transports, which is some of the things you're talking about there, of not choosing to call Orange Cross and choosing to call the fire department instead. That option will be there for them. At the present time, though, I think I heard earlier tonight that you're not planning on doing nursing home transports? Our initial proposal is just for the 911 emergency calls in the city, but we are open to doing interfacility transports if people choose to use us. Okay. Uh, if you, if you are not going to do uh, inter-facility transports or no, nursing home transports, who would do that? Would that be, have to be another, uh, another, would Orange Cross have to do that or would, would there have to be another service to provide that? Uh, yes, uh, there would have to be another service to provide that, but again, we are offering that service. Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> currently, uh, Dr. Coolis is your, is your medical director for the fire department. If you indeed uh, get the ambulance service, you're also going to have uh, you're going to have to have a medical director, I believe, uh, at the hospitals. Uh, would uh, Dr. Coolis wouldn't wouldn't be able to continue on in the capacity of the medical director as he is right now? Am I correct in that? I believe Dr. Coolis would continue as our medical director. Obviously, we would have some sort of relationship with the uh, receiving facilities, um, and we continue to look for that cooperation between us and the medical facilities. Um, if we file an operational plan with the state of Wisconsin, which we propose to do, um, we do also have to have buy-in from both of those receiving facilities to at least provide medical control online if our paramedics would happen to call those hospitals. I see no reason why those hospitals would not participate in that when they read our operational plan. Um, I have, there's nothing in my mind that says our paramedics are going to be any less qualified, and, and I do believe those hospitals would honor that request. Uh, that was a very contentious, contentious point uh, back when Curtis Ambulance uh, was the provider here in Sheboygan. And let's cut to the chase. The reason that Curtis failed is lack of cooperation from the two hospitals. They went out of business after six months because the hospitals would not cooperate with them. Uh, what assurances are you going to have that the hospitals are going to cooperate with you? I guess for a pointed answer, none. Um, I would put that to the hospitals and uh, their medical direction in their emergency facilities. Um, we're a professional organization. Again, I would expect our paramedics to be no less qualified. In fact, in the long run, I would expect them to be more qualified um, just because of the amount of time that they'd be on the job, which would equate to better uh, medical control and a more familiar um, rapport between the medics and the medical control um, at the hospital. So do we have a guarantee? No. But I would uh, call upon those hospitals to step up as well and, you know, they talk about patient care. I guess that would be the only thing I could hang my head on. Thank you. Uh, some questions that I've gotten from constituents. Uh, will the fire department be starting out January 1st with two paramedics uh, on board on the ambulances? Yes. Okay. Will the, uh, will the fire department be held to the same standards for response times as Orange Cross? Absolutely. 
who will oversee and monitor the quality of the fire department ambulance service. Uh, is, I would imagine it's going to be a continuation of the oversight committee that we have now in some shape or form. Um, I certainly anticipate an internal um, review of all of our call responses and our medical care um, in conjunction with our medical director and in conjunction with both facilities. Um, in addition to that, I would expect that there would be a committee set up within the city that would include members from our department, um, include members from uh, both medical facilities. Uh, we would review responses. I would, I would anticipate no less scrutiny. In fact, at this point, I would expect quite a bit more, um, at least initially, and uh, those plans would be included in our operational plan, which we'd file with the state of Wisconsin. And there, we fully expect to um, have an oversight committee, uh, whether that would there be a council decision as to how that would be structured and uh, where that would be located in the, in the council um, structure. Uh, it could be a subcommittee of the public protection and safety. It could be a different standalone committee, but that would be up to makeup and, uh, and location of that committee would be up to the council to decide, and we would definitely work properly cooperatively with the council to do that. Who would you, uh, who, in, who in the fire department uh, is going to be responsible then for the overall ambulance service? Would that be a, a duty of a deputy chief or what, what, who would be responsible actually for the ambulance service? Um, it will be an administrative staff person, uh, which rank at this point uh, hasn't been determined. Um, there is going to be some um, staff changes as far as administrative structure in the next year, not positions, but uh, assignments. And uh, that assignment would be um, adjusted and identified by person with highest qualifications and ability to, to uh, do that job. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. And I guess my final one then is uh, what uh, if any additional exposure do you uh, anticipate for workers' compensation losses? Is it a factor? I, I know right now you're, you're, you're at most of the calls. Is there, do you think there's any additional exposure there, there for the department? We don't believe that there will be any additional because it's not like we're adding additional call volume to our department. We've already been going to these calls. We will continue to go to these calls. I think if there was any additional exposure there, it would have been reflected in our rate from CIVMIC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Born, uh, Alderman Bourne. Um, and I believe with the numbers that we have um, appropriated for our resolution and item number six, I believe on the council floor we can adjust those numbers. And I think by Monday we'll have a little more information that we can possibly do that. Alderman Klyhunas. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, let's get philosophical uh, a little bit. Uh, Ms., uh, Alderman Manny did. Uh, I see this as a city getting seriously involved in medical care. And uh, we are not at that point. The medical care is private in this city. And the ambulance service is, a, is, is medical care. It's not rushing through the city in, you know, to get there as quickly as possible. It's giving medical care right away, and I, I see it as a serious question. The city's getting into medical care um, in a very deliberate way, and I, I just pose that as a comment. The second thing, um, I've always asked, and I've asked Chief Lefsovsky a couple times, um, you're professional firefighters. Uh, I wish this, the fire department could somehow use its skills, which they have lots of, for the underserved areas of the county in fire protection. Um, you have equipment, you have training, you have training that no one else has in the county. And why we can't somehow look at how the fire department can expand its services to the county in underserved fire areas. I, I can't believe some of the areas in our, our county that are, you know, uh, great distances between them and a fire department, a volunteer fire department. And I offer that as an, another way to look at this, that I think the fire department is underutilized, very talented, underutilized. But could it be used in, an, in the fire protection area? And I know this gets into government and sharing and everything, but that's another way of looking at shared services where we have the expertise, uh, technology, equipment. How can we expand in that way and you know, 
consider that we're looking at health care, and I, I just I, I pose that as another challenge. Any comments? I would. Um, Alder Person Clayless, I, I think I can address a little bit about your your concept and your philosophical view, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, EMS is nothing new to the fire service. Um, medical care provided pre-hospital in the field has been a part of the fire department since emergency for people that remember watching that show. This is nothing new. Pre-hospital care, field medic care in the military, um, this is something we train for. Currently tech schools right now, they recognize the uh, the shift in uh, how fire departments operate and the level of care that is provided by those individuals. Um, tech schools right now, the, the norm is fire medic programs. That's what they're developing, that's what they're doing because they recognize the need to put that medical care immediately at the patient's side. Um, we are medical professionals as well, it is what we do. Um, I've been in this field a very long time. Um, I, I think that that is a little bit of a misunderstanding about some people in the public as to what the fire departments can do because I've heard that comment a few times from people that say, boy, you know, I hope those firemen know what they're getting into, this is medicine. Well, yeah, we've been studying medicine for a very long time in pre-hospital. Um, and as far as your question regarding sharing our resources, um, we absolutely look f forward to doing that. We have, we have medical, may, excuse me, many um, resources through grant programs. Um, we have a great deal of equipment in the city based on the response for the city. Um, we recognize that surrounding communities in this area don't have the resources necessary to put those things in place. Um, we welcome the opportunity to, um, through this, ambulance proposal um, to actually get out to those other communities and do some training with their first responders, which we would also then, just by nature of what we do, bring along our technical expertise in a lot of areas, and it, and it builds relationships between us and the surrounding communities. I, um, I think this is a wonderful conduit for us to actually be able to open dialogue with these surrounding communities and actually be able to get a better relationship as far as um, providing something they need to us where they don't feel this intimidation by, you know, we don't really want to call the city fire department, you know, should we call that? But if I know somebody at X fire department's first name and I work with them on a day-to-day -day basis, um, I'm actually going to be very comfortable in calling. And I do believe that we have a lot to offer those surrounding communities. And, and I think this is, the, this is the beginning of being able to do that better. Thank you. Alderman Verhassel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, a comment and then a question. I mean, from a comment standpoint, I just want to point out from my standpoint, my need for more information, whether it be from Orange Cross or anyone outside the fire department, I hope is not construed as a judgment on the fire department or any three of you because I think the three of you are quality people. I think you've put these, in, these numbers down in good faith and I think you've tried everything you can um, to give us a reasonably clear picture. So I just want to point that out from my standpoint. Uh, I'm just an information-driven person, so I appreciate your patience. Now, my question is, and Alderman Balk and Alderman Ryan sort of touched on it, but I'm curious as to any three of you can answer this question, how you think this will play out across the county? Because what we decide here tonight, obviously, is going to have implications elsewhere around the county, whether it's Orange Cross and the neighboring communities. Some of those implications could come back on the taxpayer, and I think Alderman Manny pointed that out. How do you think, what's your, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but how do you think this will play out based on what you know other communities have done and what your peers and your, you know, your, your accomplices around the county, how do you think this will play out? Well, we don't believe that there will be a tax implication to the county and to us because we have offered that other possibility of expanding. Um, we believe and we hope, I guess, that and what we've seen in other communities is once it started up in the city, it has expanded out into the outlying areas. It just took place in Oshkosh a number of years ago, and it was very, very successful. We, as we started this process, we wanted this to be a cooperative effort to make a better system for the users, for the taxpayers. That's what we ultimately hope continues to happen with this process. Thank you. Thank you. I think we still have a motion on the floor. We can go back to that for opening up the floor to Orange Cross. Alderman Verhassel, did you still care to pursue that motion? Okay. Yes, and we had a second. Okay. So, under discussion to open the floor to Orange Cross. Would you like a roll call? I might as well. 
Alderman Boren? Aye. Alderman Bauk? Aye. Alderman Serda? Aye. Alderman Gisha? Aye. Alderman Heideman? Aye. Alderman Kittleson? Aye. Alderman Kleinunis? Aye. Alderman Manny? Aye. Alderman Meyer? Aye. Alderman Montemayor? Aye. Alderman Ryan? Aye. Alderman Vanderweel? No. Alderman Verhasseld? Aye. Alderman Wangaman? Aye. Mr. Isbell, would you? Why don't you come up front here, please? Um, and the motion carried. We will open the floor to, I may need more to Mr. Isbell. <laughs> Jerry Isabel, executive director with Orange Cross. Just a couple of quick uh, clarifications. Chuck, can I will. turn that off so it's not in his eyes? What? We can uh, turn. Well, turn that off so it's not in your eyes. I got it. He's got it here, Mr. Jim. Herman. Jim. And apologize, I don't know your rank, Mr. Herman. Um, Mr. Isabel, please come closer to and speak into the mic. You did not anticipate the four to six percent premium pay in your proposal. Is that correct? Correct. I, we did give you what that figure was. It's approximately $35,000, but from a negotiating standpoint, that ties the okay. negotiator's hand. Sure. Um, you mentioned the loaded mile for Medicare Medicaid pays at 100%? I said close to 100%. I, I believe oh. we, we ran our rate at $10 per mile. It's just a little bit short of that. It's yeah. what they're it's paying. It's $625 a loaded mile that Medicare pays. So that's, there is, that's almost 50% less than you're projecting. So it is 625. Okay. Okay, um, Alderman Verhassel, did you have some questions? Just a minute. Okay. And thank you. Would you like to continue, Mr. Isabel? Do you want me to ask? Well, I would like to have you ask the questions, right. and then Mr. Isabel can give further information after all the questions have been answered. Okay, there's, thank you. Uh, there's a couple of things that I just need to have clarified from both sides before I would be comfortable making a decision. One is, um, Medicare, Medicaid reimbursement rates, that's a big part of this equation. And the discuss, I've heard from both sides saying one says the trends are going downward, reimbursement rates are falling, others are saying it's going up. Can you shed your opinion on this? Yeah, our actual figures, and this is another clarification I was going to ask, I think you, clear, you mentioned 25% for write-offs for Medicare, Medicaid? No, Not, I said 52. Oh, okay, we're, we're showing 32% with Medicare Medicaid. Our total allowances are 40%, so that includes bad debt and things like that. Is what, number 40? 40% total allowances. Okay. Now that's including everything. That's everything, bad debt and Medicare well, Medicaid? That's all the calls we do, county, city, everything. Okay, so our number should be more than adequate. Yeah, very much so. Um, the other thing, I guess, is, and I asked the question to the three of them, is how do you see this thing playing out from your perspective? If the city is successful in taking over the ambulance service, could you shed any opinion or prediction on it? I well, obviously my opinion is not good. I, I don't agree with government taking over private enterprise. We're doing a very good service. We've been in the system since 1979, and as Dr. Martin's alluded to, she's behind our QA program. 100% and believes in our service, otherwise she wouldn't be there. Now, I guess maybe you misunderstood the question. I'm not asking whether, um, I'm not questioning your quality of service and I'm not um, asking you for your opinion on the concept. Is I guess I'm wondering how you think Orange Cross will play a role in years to come if the city takes over the portion, because I believe it's about one third of the calls, of your total calls come from the city, so we're taking 33% of your base away. It is about a third of the calls, and at this point, there's no decision been made uh, regarding what the board's decision would be on that issue. Okay. So we're not sure at this point. I guess a kind of a related question is, could you foresee what impact that would have on your rates? Again, taking one third of your calls away, if that would dramatically increase your rates? Hopefully not, because the system pays for it, but we probably would be discussing subsidy which would affect everybody in the city of Sheboygan and the county. Okay, last question, or at least one of my last questions is, some, some uh, citizens have asked me on this whole concept of urgency, and again, I would like to see this thing resolved tonight and move on to the council next week. Um, 
But from an urgency standpoint, just to put this in perspective, does Orange Cross need an, uh, a contract to operate after December 31st? No, we don't need a contract. In fact, most privates don't have a contract with the city or county that they operate in. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. One other question I have here. Um, a big part of the projection here, I mean, it starts out at $195,000 profit, I believe, and it moves up closer to half a million dollars, 400000 um, A big part of that increase, or almost more than half of it, is the projected call increases. Can you give me any history on call numbers over the last five, ten years? Where does that move? I mean, is that a static number? Alderman Klein has pointed out there where population is pretty static here in the city of Sheboygan. Is there reason to believe that those numbers will continue? Have you seen them continuing? Um, the projection, I believe they use 3%. That's what we typically budget for. Can you explain that at all? Um, I think more people do call 911 these days because they're asked to do so. I think through education, they think they need to call 911. American Heart Association advocates calling 911 for the, both the stroke and the heart attack victims. So that could contribute to that. Okay. Thank you. Is that all? Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Bulk. I, uh, I want to talk philosophically for a moment, too, uh, like Alderman Clayunas did, because uh, Jerry brought up a very good point about governments taking over private industry. And uh, I, I know in my race, I, I was a, the big capitalist in the group, and, and my constituents are sending me emails and phone calls saying, what are you thinking? Uh, and so I want to be very clear about philosophically why this may turn out to, why I believe this may turn out to be a good idea for us. Uh, Orange Cross is full, filled with wonderful people who've provided a wonderful service. They are, however, at a $1 million disadvantage to our friends in the, in the fire department. They have a $1 million in fixed assets on their financial statements that are buildings and people. And, and the reason this business model works, that it might turn out to be a good idea for our fire department to take this over, is because they, they don't have that $1 million disadvantage. They need three ambulances and four people to be able to provide the same level of service. The other point is our, our friends at Orange Cross don't pay anything to the city. There's no, no revenue benefit to the city because they're a 501c3 tax-exempt organization. So there's no revenue stream to the city. If we believe the numbers that the fire department have put together, even if it's only $100,000 or $200,000 a year over the long haul, we've accomplished two things. One of those things is we've brought in one or $200,000 a year into our coffers for the general fund. The other is we've taken our fixed assets, our men and women of the Sheboygan Fire Department, and we've put them to more and, and, and busier use. And, and putting fixed assets to use, uh, 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 unused assets are unhappy assets. And so we, uh, we can, there are two business reasons why this can make sense. So uh, I am not fond of government taking over private industry, but I think there are compelling reasons why in this instance it may make sense. And the second point is uh, I want to offer Mr. Isbell the opportunity. He mentioned that the... Uh, the $10 per loaded mile might be a little too high, and so if we take 60% of his 58,000 number, that costs us, call it $20,000 of the fire, fire department's numbers. Are there any other fundamental material numbers you would disagree with in the material you've seen tonight? Um, I haven't had the opportunity to look at the proposal. Would, would. You, would you follow up? That, that I think would be the most important thing you could do in the next six days would be to go through these numbers, and if you see anything that is materially, that you have material differences with, bring that to our attention so we can make the best decision next week. Yeah, we enjoy that opportunity. A um, couple you, things. What's your viewpoint if citizens do call 911 and ask for Orange Cross? Do you think that's... <clears throat> you want to uh, but I don't believe that's how the system works. Um, as far as uh, our perspective, the 911 service is set up to um, provide that emergency response. It's not a call funneling agency to uh, um, shift um, the responsibility to, to somebody else. So I don't believe that would be appropriate. If people call a private party number for Orange Cross, I would assume that um, it's within Orange Cross's right and obligation to respond to that. But 911 calls that come into the city, I believe, would be directed to the 911 provider, which would be the Sheboygan Fire Department. And I would like to get through the questions from the aldermen first, please, because we have four more, four more people waiting. Alderman Vanderweel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I agree with Alderman Bow. He's a very smart man. And, and thank you for pointing that out, because it seems that we're kind of having 
a debate disguised as a discussion going back and forth with Orange Cross and the fire department. And, and I, I don't really uh, agree with that. But I do want to state that, that I think the Orange Cross does an excellent job. And I've, um, I visited your facility last time. And I've enjoyed our relationship in the Ambulance Coalition. We've worked together, and the meetings aren't two hours long. And, and it's, it's been a good thing. And I, I don't ask you this question negatively. I just ask you from my own knowledge. Five years ago, there was an advertising campaign. There was magnets. There was billboards. I ask, is your organization preparing to do that this time or in the future for the same issue? That decision hasn't been made yet, and that's a board-level discussion that will take place. All right. Okay. Thank you, Alderman Vanderweel. Alderman Ryan. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Isbell, uh, you had uh, disagreed with part of the uh, fire department's numbers. If we were to provide you with their proposal, their numbers, their projected revenues, uh, would you provide us with, uh, with you know, uh, not delving into your private uh, uh, enterprise with those numbers, but uh, your actual numbers um, uh, like for like on, you know, because right now, right now the numbers that we have are very vague as far as other expenses, et cetera, that we could uh, compare those to their numbers. Yeah, and we'll certainly take a look at that and we won't criticize, however, we will give you our information from real data that we have to, to do that. You will not? We will. You will. Absolutely. Great. Right, I'm sorry. Great. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Ryan. Alderman Klyhunas. My question was answered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And we have Alderman Verhasselt. My question was answered as well. Thank well, thank you. Um, and I would, I, I agree with Alderman Vanderweel. We do not want this to turn into a debate between the fire department and Orange Cross. And I know you have some discrepancies with the numbers that the fire department has given. So I would ask you to please review the information and present that information back to us by Monday and at that point we would be able to see the differences. Would that be? Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay, well thank you very much. And we haven't, any more questions? So, oh, excuse me, is this for, okay. Alderman Gisha. Thank you. One quick comment. Orange Cross has been very uh, accommodating if you wanted to go to their office and view additional information or have meetings. I just want to make it clear. I assume the doors are still open if Alderman wished to come and talk with you. And uh, I know it was very helpful for me. Thank you for that information. Okay, moving on to the next uh, motion we have on the floor. And that was to send the two items, item five and item six, the resolution by Alderman Reinflesch, authorizing the City of Sheboygan Fire Department to provide ambulance service to its citizens beginning January 1st, 2008. And item number six, a resolution by Alderman Hanna, authorizing the transfer of appropriations in the 2007 budget. Do we have any further discussion on these items? Alderman Verhasselt. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to point out I'll be voting no to send it on with a favorable recommendation, but not because I think it's a bad idea or because I think the numbers are questionable. It's quite the contrary. I just would like to give Orange Cross the respect of letting them put their information in front of us on the council meeting on Monday night before I give it the green light. Thank you. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to uh, vote yes on number six for the transfer of the funds with the idea that we're going to uh, modify that at the uh, council meeting on Monday night. Yes, you may amend that on the council level. Thank you. Any further discussion on the motion? See none, all in, uh, do we wanna do a roll call? I think so. Okay, we will do a roll call. Alderman Boren. Well, we were going to vote. There, the motion is for both of them together. Aye. Alderman Bauk. Aye. Alderman Serda. Aye. Alderman Gisha. Aye. Alderman Heideman. Aye. Alderman Kittleson. Aye. Alderman Clyunis. No. Alderman Manny. Aye. Alderman Meyer. Aye. Alderman Meyer. Montemayor. Aye. Um, Alderman Vanderweel. Aye. Alderman Verhasselt. No. Alderman Wangaman. Aye. Motion carries. 
Alderman Ryan, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Motion carries. Moving on to item number seven, I would like a, a motion for adjournment. All in favor? Aye. And thank you, Chief Lestusky and Commander Herman and Commander Butler for your information tonight.